Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to Moaning. If you guys are new here, then what's up? My name is Erica. And today we're going to be continuing on this little Plato spiel that we've sort of had littered throughout the channel for a bit. We've already done uh, Plato's Fido, which took place like two days ago. We uploaded that. And then a couple of weeks ago, we uploaded... Oh my god. Oh, we uploaded the Republic and the Symposium and like a general introduction to Plato. So today's video is going to be on the Timaeus. If you guys are super new and you don't know anything about Plato's Timaeus and you clicked on this because you thought, why the fuck not? You should probably start with one of the other ones. Guarantee it will be easier to follow this one. But if you are here because you have already watched our other episodes and you're like, I want to know about Plato's Timaeus now because I feel like I've been studying him for a hot second, then great because welcome back. Let's just roll into the episode for you guys. <laughs> First things first, let's give you a list of all the characters who do pop up in this text because I didn't do that for Fido and a bunch of you guys, when I say a bunch of you guys, I mean like my friends who I forced to watch these videos, they messaged me being like, dude, that would probably like help if you started with that. So here's a list of all the characters that take place. Now the book is called Timaeus and that's because the main character that we're going to be talking about is Timaeus himself. So Timaeus is not super important, he just is the mouthpiece for this text. There's always a mouthpiece, it's 99% of the time Socrates, this time it just so happens to be Timaeus. Now I think that this text is one of the most rewarding and interesting Platonic texts that's out there, it's one of the most interesting dialogues to take place because it puts forward a lot of ideas that in the ancient world weren't so common, I gotta say. And so when I read it for the first time, it's li by the way guys, it's literally like this thick, it is tiny and I was gonna show you my text but I have no clue where I put it unsurprisingly I never have my text for any of these videos because I put them in a box somewhere and then I put that box somewhere else and then I can never find it I'll find it in like a month or so and I'll put it on my Instagram if you guys do want to see it but either way the writing is actually based off of a conversation that had happened the previous day so the previous day the the crew of people who are in this text, they were all talking about themes that were discussed in the Republic, so you should watch that episode first if you haven't already. So these discussions of, you know, justice and and all of that kind of jazz and the soul. That's a big one for this episode, by the way, so if you don't know how Plato defines the soul, you should watch Fido and the Republic, because we get into the soul in those a lot. So we kind of go through those themes, and this is really just picking up off of like the back end of that conversation. It's really like, we discussed everything the previous day, and now they all kind of reconvene, and Timaeus has had time to think about his argument, and so now he's gonna put it forward. Now, just as a side note, this is actually the Platonic text where they do reference Atlantis, which is super interesting, but I'm not gonna be getting into that argument today. If you want to, I can, I'm linking some things in the description below more so about the Atlantis uh, analysis, because I don't do analysis in these videos, this is all basic introduction. But we do get the themes and the conversation of Atlantis, yes, that Atlantis, the underwater city, that comes out in this text. But also, it's it, the reason why it's so interesting is because this text discusses a singular craftsman. Craftsman. A singular sort of a person who, who came upon the universe and, and made it what it is today. Singular. Okay, and that's why I think it's so interesting. But let's let's sort of just get into the text. So Timaeus starts by saying, he, he opens this whole conversation by saying that the universe is inherently good, right? And the universe is good because it was created by a good craftsman. There's the logic to it. That's as far as it goes. He says the craftsman is good, the universe is therefore good. Now because the craftsman sort of came about and he saw disorder and then he just like ordered it, essentially is what he did in order to create this, this world that we know of today, that because he just ordered it, it therefore is a living thing. That's literally the argument for it, is that he's like, well, it was ordered, it's a living thing, it, it, it breathes, it goes through all of the same processes that we do, it's living, and therefore it has intelligence, mainly because it's better to have intelligence than to not have intelligence if you're a living thing. So that's why Timaeus says, yeah, the universe is intelligent. The universe is intelligent, it's a living thing, and therefore, because it's intelligent, it therefore has a soul. That's just sort of like the opening argument that you should probably know, okay? So if you don't know the definitions of any of those words in Platonic terms, watch our previous episodes. Everything is linked in the description below or is popping up wherever that white thing pops up on the top of the screen. Now, one of the opening lines in the argument that's quite interesting is that he claims, Timaeus claims, that the universe is complete. And because the universe is complete, that's the only reason why me and you can exist within it, because it's complete and unique, and it allows us to sort of feed off of it. He doesn't use those words, obviously, but that's the logic behind that, is that because we can exist within a living thing, it must be complete in order for us to be able to benefit 
from it because if it was incomplete what could it offer us you know but it's complete it's unique it's wonderful it's brilliant and he goes into explaining that by talking about the elements of fire and earth so fire and earth he claims are the two main uh, what are those elements of the earth? He claims that those are the important ones, that everything is sort of built off of those two things. And actually water and air just mediate that, is that water and air just make sure that the fire doesn't get you carried away and that the earth doesn't get you carried away. And it's just like, okay, I'm just gonna make sure that you guys stay in your place and make sure that everything is still ordered. That's water and air's role, as opposed to fire and earth, which is the fundamental things and then those two things sit on top of it, right? Are you still with me? Because it's about to get a little bit confusing. So if you haven't really got that down packed, then just rewind the video, watch that again, because uh, we're about to get slightly more complicated. This is the moment in the text when we, we start to understand how the soul then relates to all of that, the soul of the universe. Because remember how I just said that the universe must have a soul. It must be intelligent, it must be complete, it must be unique, and therefore it has a soul. Well, the only way I can explain this is a Venn diagram, by the way. I've thought of multiple different ways to explain this. And if you look at this Venn diagram, we have sort of the three uh, elements, let's say, not elements in the way that fire and earth are elements, but more so qualities. That's a good one. So we have the three qualities that the universe has within it, I guess we could say, right? So it has being, sameness, and difference. And that's that, That's how things balance out in the universe. We need those three things. We need things that are that are the same. We need things that are different in order to, to balance out the sameness, but then also things that are being because hello, me and you. So right where they intersect in the middle is the soul of the universe and how that soul relates to all those different things and mediates, organizes, that sort of thing. It's that intersection in the middle that allows the universe to then regulate. It's a good word. So it allows the universe to regulate these three things in order for the universe to function. Okay, are we still with me? I'm trying to summarize, but it's really complicated. So I don't know if I'm doing it very well. But now based off of that little Venn diagram that I just gave you, okay, so the soul of the universe relating to other things, fantastic, great. But we need to discuss this idea of, of being within the universe. And Timaeus then moves on to this idea of being. He says, right, okay, we've established that. We've established the soul, how the soul relates to the rest of the universe. We've established like the differences, the sameness. We've established all of, all of that kind of stuff, okay? And everybody agrees. So everybody's like, okay, right, this is the base premise. Now we have to look at the constant push and pull between being and becoming, because ultimately that's another function of the universe that allows everything to work. It allows everything to do its thing. Because if we didn't have this constant push and pull of being, then we wouldn't, well, being and becoming, right? So so constantly as things are coming into being, they are becoming, there are already things that are being, right? Are you still with me? This is literally the succession of the conversation. So I'm just doing it in order. But it's then through that, it's then taken into account the idea that there's the soul, taken into account that there's the idea of everything else and movement and being. Being is the important part for this because the being and the becoming, we then have things within the universe that regulate being and becoming in a constant push and pull way, in more so the structure. So if we look at the structure of the universe, Timaeus claims that we have heavenly bodies that mark time, we have like the sun that marks the year, we have the moon that marks months, and we have stars that mark day and night. So those are things that regulate being and becoming. Time, right? All of that sort of, sort of different variations of time, not just time on a clock, all of that regulates being and becoming. Right. <laughs> I don't know if I'm explaining this really well. I'm like panicking. Let me know if you guys are still with me in the comments. Like the video if you guys are still following because it's a dense, it's short, but it's dense because after we discuss being and becoming, he then wants to discuss being, right? As I said, you know, we, we discuss being and becoming, we discuss the structure, we go into all of that. Then we have to get into me and you. And, and well, well, what are me and you made up of? Well, how, how does that work? How do we slot into it? If we've got the, the, the stars doing things, we've got the sun doing things, we've got the moon doing things. What the hell do we do? And how do we play a part in this ecosystem? How do we play a part in the Venn diagram? How do we play a part in being and becoming? How do we play a part and, and actively have a role in the way that the universe is structured? Well, Timaeus says that we're actually made up of residue from the universe itself and from the creation of the universe. 
And because we are residue from the universe and the creation of the universe, that because we're residue, that's why we're affected by all of these things. I guess the only way to describe it is sort of like now and people are just like, oh, you know, there's like positive and negative energy in the world and, and you know, we're affected by the stars and all that kind of stuff. Essentially what he's saying is that, is that he's saying that we are affected by all of that stuff. We're affected by the energy that is within the universe. We're affected by the magnetic poles of, I don't know, stars and all of that kind of bullshit. We're affected by that because we're made up of the residue that went into creating it. But it's through education and through nurturing that we can actually correct all of those disturbances, all of the negative energy essentially. We can correct all of that within us by education and nurture and and by you know teaching ourselves different things. We can realign all of the sort of disturbancing matter that, that comes from the universe. So Timaeus actually in this instance, he uses the example of eyes to show this. And he's like, you know, we train eyes to see and, and all that kind of jazz. So he uses that example, but it goes into other things as well, that he's like, there is education and there is nurturing that goes into us ultimately, ultimately existing, not positively, but, but, but not having a disturbanced existence, you know, the way that, that the stars aren't negatively impacting us, that there's a way for that to happen because we're, we're made up of the same matter of everything else in the universe, that we're the residue from all of this. And so if we can manage to center that within us, and center that through education, center that through nurturing, all of that kind of jazz, then, you know, we can be much more peaceful and exist at one with the universe. Is essentially what Plato is saying in this text through Timaeus. So, okay, so let's just take this back a hot second because there are probably a couple of things that I should hammer out in this argument that I've just presented already that definitely need a little bit more detail, but I wanted to get all of that out beforehand. So. Let's start with intelligence, because we have mentioned the intelligence beforehand and how I just kind of glossed over that, right? But now we've got sort of the basic argument put forward. We should discuss that the intelligence of the universe is not a necessity. And actually the creator, the craftsman of this whole universe doesn't have control over the intelligence of the universe. What it does have a control over is the properties that it wants the universe to have. So the craftsman can look at the universe that it's ordered. Bear in mind, the craftsman is the one that ordered everything. So the craftsman can look at that and be like, okay, I want you to do this and this and this, and this would be great and this would be fantastic and all of that kind of jazz. And without the universe being intelligent, it wouldn't allow that. So with the universe being intelligent independently, it can then allow all of those things to grow harmoniously within the universe. And then we can then use it at our disposal because then we come into being in the universe. Right? So that's kind of where the intelligence uh, uh, really is important in it. And I wanted to explain us being residue because the craftsman can put in the idea of us into the universe and be like, I want this to grow. But without the universe being intelligent, then therefore the residue, us, us, the residue, could not then build off of other things. Right? Now, another idea that could only have been explained after explaining the whole basic idea of the argument is this idea of the third kind. So this is sort of a term that is pegged by a lot of modern philosophers now and we discuss the third kind because it directly works in relation to Plato's Timaeus. So the third kind starts off, we must start with like the first kind essentially, which is the world of the forms, which I've explained before. So we have the world of the forms which exists first, okay? And that's sort of like an idea of everything that we know. So there's a form of that plant somewhere else in another world and it's not physical it's just a form of it or a form of like this cassette right there's a form of those things. well these are technically complex forms but we're not going to go into that but technically there's like a form of them somewhere which is why we can recognize them in this world so everything starts off as a form now the craftsman then takes those forms previously the craftsman took that form and popped it into the universe and ordered it within the universe so fire water air fire earth, oh fire earth what? Fire, water, earth, air. Those are the four elements, right? Took me a hot second. But those four elements, those were initially forms. And the ones that we see today are merely like copies. They're like traces of the forms and that's how we can identify them. So that's essentially seeing it as like the, th the second kind even. <laughs> this is like, like the second kind. Now the third kind is quite complicated because the third kind, Timaeus says, it, he, God. To me, I don't know how to explain this simply, in all honesty, but I'm gonna try. So essentially Timaeus says the third kind comes into it where everything is made up of triangles, right? Everything, it lit like, ev like, like the form of this thing or this thing itself is can be broken down to like triangles. 
And the reason why things end up mushing together is because we're trying to put all of these triangles into a sphere that is the universe. So the elements, let's go back to like earth, wind, fire, air, whatever that band is called. So if we go back to that for a hot second, that all of those elements can be broken down into triangles and the way that they fit together. So, you know, you can have like two triangles like, like this to make a box or whatever, that when you have all of those, that's great because all of them can reinforce each other. They are dependent on each other, right? Because they're all triangles leaning on each other. So that's fantastic. However, because they're trying to fit into a sphere, it gets complicated because then they all have to mush together to make up like the, the extra like rounded space on the side of the sphere. So in those areas where it all like mushes is where we see various elements become one, is in, is in the mush, is in the mush in these teeny tiny gaps and spaces in the universal structure that the craftsman, I don't know why everything, he made everything into a sphere when everything is technically triangles. That's an element of the analysis of this text. But anyways, that's, that's the rule. Now explaining it through the elements is obviously like the nice, simple example. But this also goes into opposites and why opposites exist. This goes into all qualities of, of the universe and how these things can exist together and are needed for each other because, you know, where hot meets cold, they're like squished into like a little part of the universe as well. There's like a little gap where both of them can be squished together and all of that kind of jazz. And, and it's all sort of needed in order to balance everything out. So that's a little bit more detail. That, by the way, is the third kind. The space is the third kind. That's where that is. It's in the little space. It's where everything sort of amalgamates together and how you have the triangles and then all the space and then everything that, that mushes together in the little space that allows the universe to grow, essentially. We're gonna get into a little bit more detail, just a little bit, I promise guys, because I couldn't just leave you with the basic argument that I presented at the beginning because I know that all of you guys were watching this going, excuse me, what the f are you talking about? Now the last, the last, last little bit of a little bit more detail that we're just gonna get into is the craftsman himself. Okay, because this is super important. And I didn't want to start with this because I wanted to end with this because it's the most interesting to me and I think that, that we, should, we should go into more detail. So, craftsmen. A lot of you guys will probably be thinking that the fact that there's a craftsman that created the universe is very, you know, much a, in relation to a Christian sort of God or whatever singular God that you believe in. I don't know how many monotheistic religions that are in the world, but it is very representative of that, which is super interesting. Now, a lot of arguments for this craftsman in this sort of context uh, and, and for the, the not a monotheistic idea. I want to highlight that, that it's not a monotheistic idea because Timaeus puts forward that even though this craftsman created the individual souls, hello, me and you, individual souls, individual people, doesn't have any control over them. None at all created the matter, what the craftsman did is create the matter that then became me and you, because we're the residue, right? So he put all the matter into the universe, ordered it, and then poof, I showed up, or you showed up, but he does not have control over the moves that we make. This links to an idea that Plato put forward in The Republic about souls, so you want to watch that episode for all of that in-depth discussion about souls and how and how they're governed and how they move and, and what it means to have a soul, all of that kind of stuff is in that episode, so check that out. But here is where Timaeus sort of says that that the soul, let's say, and sectors of the soul are aligned to organs, and that's how we then become physical. And that has nothing to do with the craftsman, necessarily, because he's not a monotheistic craftsman. It's not a religious type of thing in that sort of sense, because the craftsman put everything and then left. So if you know the sort of idea of deism, that's more so relating to the idea that Timaeus puts forward. It's very much like the craftsman came, did his thing, and then he off and he left the Greek gods in charge of everything to make sure that everything sort of governed the way that it should govern. But he fucked off long ago, like he doesn't give a shit. And that's why, well, Timaeus says that then the soul is aligned to different organs of the body uh, and why we have different parts that sort of sit in different organs because that's how then we are then attached to our physical body. Did I just make that make sense? Or did I just overcomplicate it? I mean, if it makes it easier, it's more so like intellect, right? That that's part of the soul that doesn't come with the physical body, but that's attached onto your brain, if that helps. So the way that that's attached onto your brain is how the soul clings onto the physical body and how we're given a physical body through the, 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 what is that? Yeah, intangible way of the soul. 
essentially. I feel like I'm overcomplicating it. Oh God, guys, I'm so sorry. I'm just gonna wrap it up now because <laughs> I feel like I'm overcomplicating it. But the craftsman is sometimes thought of to just represent intellect itself. Maybe that's what the craftsman is supposed to represent. But what you guys need to remember is that the Timaeus talks specifically about this idea of a craftsman creating the universe and creating everything within the universe. And there are loads, loads of things that I didn't discuss. I tried to just get into the, the very basic discussion of how the order worked the Venn diagram, with the triangles, with all of that kind of stuff sort of working together in order to make this, this whole thing happen, you know, like all of this happen is uh, because that's something that's put forward in the Timaeus. And it's a different argument to one that's been put forward before by Plato, which is why the text is so interesting. And every time you read it, there's something new that pops out. And I think the, the discussion even of the craftsman is so, so interesting. And so it's definitely worth a read, super thin you're gonna have to read it like three or four times. I think I've read it now six times in total. And yet still I'm like, I'm sorry, what did that mean? Excuse me, can we try that again? But either way, Timaeus is super duper interesting. And just a point to leave you guys on is that in my Plato introduction episode, I actually mentioned how Timaeus is the book that is held by Plato in Raphael's School of Athens, which is right here. And the reason why I think that is so interesting is because it does not put forward monotheistic ideals. That's not what this text does at all, even slightly. However, it's very interesting that the, the the church essentially picked up on the text and read in what they wanted to read into it and then could easily, like like it's so easy to slot this text into a modern, modern understanding of religious context. That makes sense? That the fact that the ancient world can literally be picked up and slotted into something where it makes no sense whatsoever, but it, it I mean, no sense in regard to if you understand the text, it's like, <laughs> that's not what I was saying. But I just think that that's so interesting that Raphael did that and slotted it into the text because he could have used anything else. He could have just been like, hey, his idea of the soul in the Republic was super dope. I'm gonna throw that into the thing. Nope, he used the Timaeus and now it's in the f***ing Vatican. I think that's thrilling. I think that is so interesting. That could just be me. And literally when I saw it in person, I was like, Oh my God, they use the craftsman here, even though it's more deistic than monotheistic, but whatever. So that's what I'm gonna leave you guys with today. I know that was long. I'm so sorry if I overcomplicated it. I really, really don't mean to. It just tends to happen because I just start yammering about Plato, but thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thank you guys so much for giving Plato and the Timaeus the time of day. We appreciate it so much here on Moaning. I appreciate it, it's mad. So thank you guys so much for tuning in and we'll be seeing you in two days actually with Plato's Apology. So tune in for that and we'll see you then. Cheers guys.